temperature and then developing a bit more widely across northern England and North Wales. But away from those showers, actually a bit more sunshine compared with today, with temperatures reaching 25 or 26 Celsius in the south, high teens, low 20s in the north. Any showers once again tend to disappear inland through the evening, but one or two will continue to affect coastal parts of eastern England. But otherwise, clear spells for many on Wednesday night and another fine day to come on Thursday. Then a change starts to get going on Friday and more especially on Saturday, turning much more unsettled with some heavy rain. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Gloria DiPiero. More strikes are taking place, this time it's BT workers. Also, it's back to school next week. How are hard-pressed families affording school uniforms? We'll be talking about that. And how safe is it to terminate a pregnancy at home by taking a, a pill? That too, all of that, in fact, and much more after your news with Rosie. Good afternoon. It's just one minute past 12. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. The whole of the southwest of England is now in drought, following some of the driest conditions in nearly 90 years. The Environment Agency says Bristol, Somerset, Dorset, South Gloucestershire and parts of Wiltshire have all moved to drought status. Well, it now means that 11 of the 14 Environment Agency areas in England are now in drought status. The London Mayor Sadiq Khan says he's sickened by the fatal stabbing of 21-year-old Takaya Nimhard at Notting Hill Carnival. A murder inquiry is underway after the Bristol rapper, who performed under the stage name Take or Stretch, was attacked in Labrick Grove area last night. He died in hospital. The Metropolitan Police made 209 arrests at the carnival over the bank holiday weekend, including 46 for assault and 33 for possessing an offensive weapon. More than 30 arrests have been made in Liverpool following the fatal shooting of nine-year-old Olivia pratt Corbel. The schoolgirl is one of four people who've been killed in Merseyside this month. Operation Miller, undertaken by Merseyside police, is part of a crackdown on organised crime. The force made 32 arrests and stopped to search a further 66 people. The police says it will leave no stone unturned to protect the public. 
Ukraine says it's taking back territory occupied by Russian forces in several areas of the front line after launching a counterattack. Ukrainian forces have launched an offensive near Kherson in the south of the country. Britain's Ministry of Defence say long-range precision strikes continue to disrupt Russia's resupply efforts. However, the Kremlin insists the assault has failed. President Zelensky is urging Russian troops to flee. The occupiers must know we will chase them to the border, to our border, which line has not been changed. Occupiers are well aware of it. If they want to survive, it's time for the Russian military to run away. Go home. If you're afraid of going back home to Russia, well then let such occupiers surrender and we'll guarantee them that all the norms of the Geneva Conventions will be fulfilled. If they don't hear me, they will have to deal with our defenders who will not stop until they free everything that belongs to Ukraine. Iraqi cleric Muqtada al-Sadr has told his followers to end their protests after nearly two days of violent clashes between the rival Muslim groups in central Baghdad. 22 people have been killed in demonstrations which started after al-Sadr announced his retirement from politics. Dozens more were injured after protesters stormed the presidential palace. Iraq's government's been deadlocked since Mr al sadars party won the largest share of seats in parliamentary elections in October, but not enough to secure a majority government. The UN Secretary-General warns that Pakistan is facing a monsoon on steroids after catastrophic flooding killed over 1,000 people. Antonio Guterres is urging the world to help as he launched a $160 million pound appeal, sorry, dollar appeal. He said funds raised would provide 5.2 million people with food, water, sanitation and health support. More than 33 million people have been affected by flooding in the country. Pubs and brewers across the UK are at risk of closure within months amid energy price hikes of 300%, according to industry bosses. Six of the UK's biggest firms have signed an open letter to the government asking for action to avoid irreversible damage to the sector. Some pub owners say they're now struggling to find suppliers who are even willing to power their venues. Well, meanwhile, the Chancellor is going to travel to the United States this week to try to find joint solutions for the cost of living crisis. Nadeem Zahawi will meet with government officials and bankers in New York and Washington, D.C. The Treasury say he'll push for cooperation on energy security, tackling spiralling prices and economic growth. Liz Truss's campaign team say she'll wait until she becomes Prime Minister before finalising her plans for cost of living support. The Tory leadership contender wants to hold off until she's heard full advice, which she won't have until and if she's appointed as PM. The Labour Party, though, say Liz Truss is causing families unnecessary worry. The Labour chair, Annelise Dodds, told us Liz Truss needs to act now. Energy price rises, as you know, they're a big contributor to inflation. If we manage to stop that price rise, uh, that price cap rise going through, then we would be reducing the rate of inflation. That would, for example, get the cost of government borrowing down as well. So it's really important that Trust actually listens to what Labour is calling for and stops flip-flopping about with all these different plans that she seems to be floating, actually gets a grip and says that she'll commit to Labour's plan. BT and open-reach workers are staging fresh strikes over pay as the summer of industrial unrest across the country continues. The Communication Workers' Union says 40,000 of its members at BT Group are showing serious determination to get a decent wage rise. The General Secretary of the Communications Workers' Union, Dave Ward, says BT and open-reach are refusing to negotiate after imposing a pay settlement. A pay rise is affordable, so this is not a question of affordability. This is a question of the choices that people at the top of companies are deliberately making. And what they're actually saying to their own workers who have made those profits is that th no matter what the contribution you make to the success of this company, yes. we're going to ensure that you're poorer. This is GB News. We'll have more as it happens. Now let's go back to the briefing with Gloria. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, first it was rail workers, now BT and open reach workers are striking, criminal barristers too. Our reporter will bring us the latest. I'll talk with former Conservative advisor James Starkey and former Labour advisor Tom Hamilton about the challenges facing our incoming Prime Minister. As kids head back to school, parents are shelling out for uniforms. It's the last thing many hard-pressed families need. I'll discuss that with Mike Amesbury, the Labour MP 
and a charity who help us to supply school uniforms. We're also talking Boris Johnson's last week as Prime Minister, abortion pills and one year since the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And as always, I'd love to hear from you, especially on school uniforms actually. Email me at gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, yes, he is still Prime Minister. He's heading to Dorset today, accompanied by his digital secretary and die-hard supporter, Nadine Dorries. He'll be trumpeting a £5 billion government scheme to get fast broadband connections to remote areas. But it comes on a day that 40,000 BT and Open Reach workers, who look after much of the country's internet infrastructure, infrastructure walk out in a dispute over pay. Let's speak to our GB News East Midlands reporter, Will Hollis. Will, just tell us a bit more about the source of this dispute. Yeah, good afternoon from Lincoln, where I'm on a uh, communication workers' union picket line right in the heart of the city centre. This is the second wave of strike action for these particular workers uh, from BT and Openreach. The first one happened in July. That was the first time any workers from BT have been on strike for 35 years, 1987. And it's basically about pay. Uh, BT awarded a 5% pay rise back in April, but these guys weren't really too happy about that. That's enough from me, though, just to give you a little bit more of a background. Uh, Mark Pastorelli is the local secretary for this particular branch. Yep. Um, Mark, you're on a really busy road over here. There's lots of people going past. What's the reception been like for your team today? Absolutely perfect. Um, we've got every single member out. Um, we're looking at... Um, the public, the public are giving us so much support, and, and so they should be, because we've got strikes going on all over the country for di different reasons. Well, it's for one reason. It's the reason is money. It's about the cost of living going up, and we're here. here. Our, our people here will work through the pandemic. All of them, they're key workers, and for Philip Jansen to actually treat our. our our members like this with the contempt of imposing a pay rise. This is where we're at. You know, every year the, the, uh, uh, the board has sat round with the CW and negotiated a really good pay rise. It could have been a two-year pay rise or a one-year pay rise, but they, they haven't even done that, you know. There's no other companies doing that around. We're seeing that more companies are trying to do this, um, and I think that's what they're trying to do is union bust. Uh, uh, and and that, that is just, no. My, my members are not happy. The cost of living is going right down. We've got call centres, people working at £19,000 a year, sitting next to somebody else who's on £31,000 a year. So, you know, we want to bring this up. We're not asking for the world, but we don't, we don't need a pay rise. We want a pay rise. We need something. But the company is not sitting around. The CWU, Andy Kerr and uh, the General, De uh, General Secretary, Dave Ward, I sat around and said, we, we can, we'll sit down at any time. Now, Jensen, your turn. We haven't heard from you. Now get round the table. Uh, we are hearing cars going past and they oh, are, they are pipping. You, you are getting the support, but also there are people who aren't happy about all of these strikes, RMT rail strikes, uh, Felix Stowe strikes. Um, are people right to be worried about the kind of disruption that might be happening in the, in the next few months? I think that there's a yin and yang there, but um, it's for a purpose. I think the public do actually understand because we're all in the same boat. We're all singing off the same hymn sheet. If it wasn't, if we were asking for a pay rise which wasn't deserved or couldn't be afforded with, like if you look at BT, BT PLC made 1.3 billion. Sorry, I was going to say um, million, but it's billion. You know, in the first quarter. Now, if they paid 0.5% of that profit to my members. That will be it. We'll, we'll, go, we'll, go, we'll go back to work. That's not a problem. But they're not. And it is, it, and it's continued. I think the public are uh, with us. And the RMT, we will support them. They will support us. We've had people up here this morning walking past and saying hello and giving solidarity to us. So that's all we want. We want a fair pay rise. Simple as that. It's uh, no denying, Mark, that I'm a little bit younger than you. I don't remember, because I wasn't born in the 70s or the 80s, that era, era of strikes. But is this going to be a bit more of a, um, a, a milestone for seeing more strikes and seeing more union action and more solidarity, as you might say? 
I, I think you are, and I think it's done for a, a purpose. It's not like the 70s, like an all-out all strike. We're not doing all-out strikes. What we're looking at as well, because of our members, we don't want to see them go into hardship in respect of, you know, taking two days off this week um, is going to cause people there. We have a hardship fund. But I think the public and uh, are on us. But what we need is the government to take action here. Yeah. We need we need their their inputs, but they're not doing anything. I can't see sure. them doing anything at the moment. Mark, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, we're going to be here for most of the day uh, speaking to these people and bringing you a few of the workers uh, of Mark. Of course, Mark was uh, a secretary for the, uh, the branch, the local branch here, but we'll also be speaking to some workers a little bit later on for you, Gloria. Will Hollis, our East Midlands reporter, bringing us the views from the picket line in Lincoln. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Now, as the current Prime Minister hits the road with a bid to tout his achievements, the person leading the race to be the next Prime Minister seems to be nowhere to be seen. Liz Truss pulled out of a BBC interview scheduled for tonight. Well, joining me now, former Labour adviser Tom Hamilton and former Conservative adviser James Starkey. Uh, welcome back uh, to the show, gentlemen. We're hearing about strikes there. What a huge entry that new Prime Minister is going to face when he or probably she takes over. I wanted to ask you something about Parliament, because Parliament hasn't been sitting since the end of July. They come back on Monday, next Monday. They're off again on the 22nd, not back until the 17th of October. Isn't it going to feel ridiculous when people are so anxious about their bills that they're both off talking to the party faithful? Tom, I'll start with you. Well, I think that's part of what's going on. But part of what happens at party conferences is the uh, the party leaders, the parties talking about the big issues facing the country and what they do about it. I would hope and expect that Liz Truss, by the time we get to party conference season, would have said a bit more than she has already about what she wants to do about the cost of living crisis. I'm sure that Keir Starmer and the Labour Party will want to use their conference partly as a platform to challenge that. I think what the party, what the public probably wouldn't forgive any of the parties of their conferences is if they use that time not to talk about those big issues that people are worried about, but to talk about other minor issues that might concern party members but don't concern the public so much. I think the leadership's will both be quite alive to that worry and that possibility. The members aren't always as alive as the leaderships are to that sort of uh, that sort of issue. So there's a danger of distraction. But I don't think that the party conferences in themselves are a problem because they really are a platform to talk about these issues. So it is politicians doing their job and telling us what they'll do. Whether we agree with the solutions they come up with is a different question. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a fair argument. Uh, do, do you buy that argument, uh, James? Is Parliament, does it sit enough? I mean, it's... He'll be sitting for, what, a number of weeks or out of the last three, probably, by the well, time you get back to 17th of October? I, um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Gloria. I totally agree with Tom, actually. I think um, it depends how the time is used and how the, uh, the, you know, the events are used themselves. I think it's, it's, it's not feasible for Liz to get to, if Liz does win, to get through the next month and to conference without talking about uh, you know, the cost of living crisis. And I, I do think you know, people don't notice whether Parliament's sitting or not sitting. They notice whether or not politicians are doing something and doing something about the things that they care about. And I think that's the, you know, the big thing that the, the Conservative Party need to get on with. I do think to your point about, you know, whether or not they've been around and Tom's point about what they're talking about, we can't spend another month just talking about ourselves because that is what the Conservative Party have been doing for the last six weeks for, for legitimate reasons to select a leader. But nonetheless, you know, as Tom pointed out, it's got to be about the issues that people care about. Um, James, I'm going to stick with you. There's a bit of a hoo-ha, perhaps it's a media hoo-ha, about Liz Truss cancelling a set-piece interview with the BBC, which was scheduled uh, to go out this evening. Rishi Sunak says she is avoiding scrutiny. Actually, she's done loads of interviews. Uh, they both have. Uh, Liz Truss has done, uh, done one here on GB News. They've both done many televised hostings. She has every right to turn down, down, turn down an interview, doesn't she? Yes, I agree. I mean, I personally would never have agreed to it in the first place. I think it's totally pointless. And it's one of these kinds of, frankly, like Twitter arguments about whether or not someone's agreed to an interview. In any campaign, you've got to focus on the people that are selecting you. Um, some, you know, some conservative members will watch these interviews, but that's not the bulk of the audience. I also think, to be brutally honest, if you're the front runner, as she is, then doing interviews that are high risk, you know, personally, I would avoid them. 
OK, um, let's move on uh, and I'll go to you, Tom. Boris Johnson is uh, on a farewell tour of Britain. It, it's, it's going to be short because he won't be in post uh, this time next week. And it's a general question. You've worked with... Uh, you've seen Labour prime ministers go along to, in the olden days when they used to exist. <laughs> but you've seen Labour leaders uh, go and you've watched them at close quarters. How do you bow out gracefully from politics? Well, I think if you really want to bow out gracefully from politics, you go fairly quietly. You 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 say goodbye. You say thank you. Um, you you do talk a little bit about what you think you've achieved, but you acknowledge that um, that, that it's time to move on. Now, clearly, not all politicians leave happily. Some lose elections. Some are kicked out by their parties. There are sorts of. Um, I mean, Boris Johnson clearly didn't want to go at this at, at this point. I'm not convinced that he will bow out gracefully, um, because. I think he resents the way that, that he was kicked out, and um, that could well cause problems for the for the incoming leader. In terms of, I, mean, I think I think there are there are problems facing the Conservative Party now about how far they want to say that Boris Johnson was a great prime minister and how far they want to say he was a disaster. If he was a great prime minister, why did they get rid of him? If he was a disaster, that's a bit of a problem for what they want to do going forward, particularly because Liz Truss wants to endorse a lot of what he did. So that's a, a real dilemma for them. So far as he's concerned, though, I, mean, I think he's going to want to say as positive um, a set of things as he can about his, his record. He's going to have plenty of platforms to do it. And um, if I were Liz Truss, it wouldn't be my biggest worry by a long way, but it would be a small worry. James, uh, Tom from Labour doesn't think Boris Johnson will bow out gracefully. Do you? And how, how could he bow out gracefully? Uh, well, I don't think it's about graceful or not. I think anyone wants to set out their legacy. Um, any politician wants to do that in some way. Um, I imagine that Boris Johnson will take the kind of Churchill approach and say that, you know, history, I intend history to be kind to me, I intend to write it. I imagine we'll see, you know, a book and all that kind of stuff from him fairly quickly. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think, you know, whether you're Tony Blair, whether you're Theresa May, whether you're John Major, everybody cares about how they're perceived by the public. You know, these are people that, um, you know, go and, go and stood in front of the electorate in the first place. So I think, uh, as Tom says, it will be interesting to see how the Conservative Party, I think you've already seen that over the summer. There's certainly kind of buyers or maybe in this case sellers remorse um, and people kind of pointing out, you know, got he got Brexit done. He actually did a pretty decent job uh, during COVID, you know, you know, obviously had his troubles, but in terms of actually the handling of it, and he'll be looking to set that out as his legacy um, in the most positive way possible. But, uh, you know, it is a problem for who comes next. You know, how do they deal with that? He's a big, big voice, probably the most prominent politician we've had in this country for a decade. OK, I'm going to go left field from a final question because you two are used to, or if you're good at your jobs, which uh, and you, you both were, you had to manage the reputation of the politicians you worked for. Meghan Markle, who I think it's fair to say divides opinion, but has a very largely hostile British media. When it comes to the British media, if they're hostile to somebody, is it possible, if you are brilliant at your job, to change their image and change uh, the perception of the media? Uh, Tom? Well, I think it is possible. Certainly, the perception can change because Meghan Markle hasn't always had negative press from the, from the British media. So, clearly, uh, that's a change that's happened. It's not impossible that it can go the other way. I think one of the differences between the, the, world, in, the world in which James and I have both worked in terms of um, politics and the royal family or other areas of public life is that politicians can be very here today, gone tomorrow. They win elections, they lose elections. If they lose elections, they're gone. And it's quite hard to rebuild after that. Um, and also their popularity depends on things that they do that may well affect real people in adverse ways. Royals, pop stars, um, other celebrities are not, you know, they, they don't work in the same way. Um, you know, Meghan Markle isn't going to get voted out by anyone. If she's got staying power and she wants to remain, remain as a public figure, she will be a public figure for years and decades to come. And I don't see any reason why, over the course of that time, her reputation might well improve. But some of the things that she says are things that are not designed, frankly, to go down that well in the British media. If she's comfortable with that, then fine. But poor headlines are part of the price that she pays for that. But she can. You know, there's all sorts of ways that she can change over the very long career she's got ahead of her. James, I would love to come to you, but we're, we're out of time because you're just...
both so fascinating. We could talk to you for so much longer, and we will have you back again soon. Uh, James Starkey, former government advisor, Tom Hamilton, former Labour advisor, thanks as ever for your insights. Now, as we've been hearing, it's Boris Johnson's last week as Prime Minister. The new leader will, of course, be announced on Monday and enter Downing Street next Tuesday. Our political correspondent, Tom Harwood, is in Downing Street. Tom, you have been at the last briefing by Prime Minister Johnson's official spokesperson. What did you learn? What was the mood like? Yes, yeah, certainly the last well-attended briefing by the uh, Prime Minister's official spokesman because we did learn that there will be one on the Prime Minister's very last day in office on Monday. Now, these briefings start at 11.30 every day and given that we learn the new Prime Minister at midday, I can fairly be safe to assume that basically no political journalists will be at the one next Monday because we'll all be over at the QE2 centre listening to whoever the next Prime Minister is going to be and that big announcement. So today we were talking a lot about the logistics there. What's happening this week? What is going to go on at the start of next week? Of course, we learn the new Prime Minister on the Monday. We learn that at 12 o'clock at midday. But it's not until the Tuesday that this outgoing Prime Minister goes to see the Queen. Now, it's not yet entirely certain where the Queen will be. We're told this is a matter for the Palace, that the Palace are taking a lead on this. Although I did get the distinct impression it's Number 10's strong desire that the Queen doesn't stay up in Scotland, that she comes to London, whether that's Windsor, whether that's uh, Buckingham Palace, of course, not yet to be sure, not yet to be sure wherever she will be. But the plan is that the Prime Minister says some outgoing words here on Downing Street on Tuesday when he leaves that building for the last time as Prime Minister. Then the usual way things work is he goes off to see the Queen uh, just as the new Prime Minister then turns up to see the Queen as he leaves. And that new Prime Minister then comes to Downing Street. And I've got to say the preparations here on the street are well underway. Actually, we could swing around and show we're just the only people here on this street at the moment, but they are constructing scaffolds for the world's media to appear here, for the world's media to see that next Prime Minister, whatever he or she may have to say, and of course, the outgoing words of Boris Johnson as well. So those preparations well underway, but for now, this is Boris Johnson's last week as Prime Minister. And there are rumours that he does want to give some sort of large announcement later this week. There are rumours that he wants to approve Sizewell C, that new nuclear power station, that he wants to get that going as his last act as Prime Minister. Clearly, energy is the dominant theme, not only this week, but it will be for the next year at least. And it would be at least somewhat of a legacy to get the British nuclear state in the sclerotic state that it has been. Getting that up at least a little way would be something to bow out on, although discussions, we're told, are still ongoing. Firm up those rumours, Tom, you can. Tom Howard in Downing Street. What a week it's going to be next week. Thank you. Now, kids grow fast and the new school year means parents shelling out for new uniforms. The last thing families need is they worry about soaring costs. Joining me now is Labour MP Mike Amesbury, who changed the law to make uniforms cheaper. And Emma Cantrell, the CEO of First Group Children's Charity. Mike, uh, well, good to see you both. I'm going to start with Mike. Uh, you changed the law on school uniforms. You did that as a backbench yes. MP. Yep. What you, what, the way you changed the rules was so that schools couldn't say you've got to buy it from one particular supplier with one particular brand, uh, allowing uniforms to be cheaper. So my question to you is, I'm sure everybody will applaud your, your, uh, your result in changing the law. Are schools following the new law? Um, there's some great examples of schools that are following the law that have consulta uh, done consultations quite widely with parents and carers. And of course, there are a few bad apples that have their head in the sand. This will be an opportunity to, to test the strength of that law to ensure, Gloria, that um, affordability is put centre stage, which, as you rightfully say, is more important uh, than ever in terms of this cost of living crisis when we look at those energy bills just coming down the line. And just 
give, give advice, Mike, if you would, to any parent or grandparent who is watching this who's still being told to buy that particular branded blazer from that, the particular school or, or outlet. What power do parents have to challenge it? Well, in, in, in the past, there was voluntary guidance where parents and carers could go to the head teacher, principal or, or governors. Now that um, affordability is written into law, the, the, they must ensure that school uniforms, and that includes PE kits as, as well, are affordable. Not only do they have the power to go to the principals, the head teachers, the governors, but also to the Department for Education and the Secretary of State. Branding must be kept to a minimum. Um, that where there's single supplier relationships, tendering must be introduced to bring in competition to bring costs down. It's also written to the law about establishing swap shops, which many great schools are, are doing in partnership with, with parents at the moment. Um, again, to ensure that actually it'd be good for the environment, also good for the pocket as well. Okay. Emma, let me turn to you, because even if the new guidance is properly followed, and um, Mike seems fairly optimistic about that, but there'll be parents who just simply can't afford a uniform despite the new guidance. Um, and you're doing some interesting work on that, Emma, your charity. Tell us about that. Thank you. Yeah, at First Days, we support families who have really got no other choice. They just simply cannot afford um, the uniform that the school is asking them to buy. And sadly, we've not seen any change at all in any of the schools we work with yet. Um, we're still having to find these logoed, branded items for, for most children. This year, so far, and we've still got another week left of the summer holidays before term starts, we've supported over 400 children whose parents simply would have no other option of what they can afford when it comes to school uniforms. And that is providing them with all of those things that are overly expensive, like blazers and PE kits with logos on, trainers, shoes, all those things that are just absolutely unaffordable. And this will only get worse now as the cost of living crisis deepens. And, and Emma, I wanted to follow up on that, on the kind of people you are um, helping. Are they working parents? Or larger yes. people who are not, they're, they're largely working parents. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're based in Wokingham in Berkshire, so it's a very affluent area. But obviously, there are lots of people who live here, who have lived here for a long time, who have family here, who are in low paid jobs, and they're just struggling to make ends meet. So over 60% of the families we support have at least one parent in work. Um, others are, you know, dealing with children with disabilities and all those things that prevent them from working. But, you know, ultimately, the majority of the parents we support are those who who are in those lower paid jobs, who are working all the hours they can to pay for food and bills and childcare and all of those things. And the school uniform is just a step too far in the household budget. Mike, I'll tell you one thing uh, that happens now, which didn't happen when you and I were at school. The proms, the World Book Days, all of those things. And I, I mean, I was a free school meal kid. I know that those days would have been utterly traumatic for me and my parents. Is, are you concerned about the proliferation of these days? Absolutely, and I've seen it with uh, academisation and, you know, that if a child walks, then we need to brand <laughs> every school item. Uh, I'm from a very similar background to you, Gloria, as, 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 as you know, and, uh, and no, didn't face those pressures, face uh, significant uh, pressures in terms of the family budget way back in way back in the 80s but, but my god as, as you rightfully say that the, 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 this has become uh, crazy it's it's, it's a uh, i know it's been used uh, in in regards to somebody else's phrase recently but it is it's a it's a holiday from reality isn't it reality of what people are facing in the community Emma, is that the sort of thing that your organization campaigns on does it concern you about about, about people of being able to afford or be sort of poverty shamed, really, if you can't afford to go to school on these days. I, I didn't even, well, probably shouldn't say this, but even on where you're on clothes to school day, I often didn't, didn't go because I didn't have good enough clothes. Absolutely. It's a huge, huge problem. And, you know, what we do is try and fill the gap. So we provide children with the dressing up clothes for World Book Day, but we would really like to not exist as a charity. You know, we believe that 
every parent should be able to afford the basics for their children. And also schools need to play a part in making the school day affordable. You know, charities like mine should not be here to fill in the gaps, to cover over, you know, elitist school policies and things that just prohibit children from participating in school life. You know, there's been, been some brilliant work done in Scotland on the cost of the school day. And we'd love to see that in England as well, where the day has to be affordable for every single child because it causes parents huge levels of stress when they're having to come up with dressing up clothes. And as you say, wear your own clothes to school day and give a donation and bring this in for this event and all of that. It's, it's huge and it causes so much stress and definitely causes you know feelings of inequality in children which has a huge detrimental effect on their potential their mental health how they feel about themselves which you know will have a knock-on effect throughout their life so definitely so much more needs to be done to make the school day affordable for everyone really enjoyed talking to you both um, really pleased that we covered this issue it won't be the last time sadly uh, but good work from both of you emma cantrell ceo of first group children's charity and labor mp mike amesbury thank you both for your time next we have a gb news exclusive as ambulance call outs rise for women who've taken abortion pills at home and home lots more too after the news with rosie Good afternoon, it's 12.33. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. A man stabbed to death at the Notting Hill Carnival has been named as 21-year-old Takai Nimhard. A murder inquiry is underway after the Bristol rapper, who performed under the stage name T Cor Stretch, was attached in the Labrook Grove area last night. London Mayor Sadiq Khan says he's sickened by the incident. The Metropolitan Police made 209 arrests at the event over the bank holiday weekend, including 33 for possessing an offensive weapon. Ukraine says it's taking back territory occupied by Russia in several areas of the front line after a counterattack. Ukrainian forces have launched an offensive near Kherson in the south of the country. President Zelensky is urging Russian troops to flee. Britain's Ministry of Defence say long-range precision strikes continue to disrupt Russia's resupply efforts. However, the Kremlin insists that Ukraine's counterattack has failed. Pubs and brewers across the UK are at risk of closure within months amid energy price hikes of 300%, according to some industry bosses. Six of the UK's biggest firms have signed an open letter to the government asking for action to avoid irreversible damage to the sector. Some pub owners say they're now struggling to find suppliers who are even willing to power their venues. BT and open reach workers are staging fresh strikes over pay as the summer of industrial unrest across the country continues. The Communication Workers Union says 40,000 of its members at BT Group are showing serious determination to get a decent wage rise. The whole of the southwest of England is now in drought following some of the driest conditions in nearly 90 years. The Environment Agency says Bristol, Somerset, Dorset, South Gloucestershire and parts of Wiltshire have all moved into that status. It now means 11 of the 14 Environment Agency areas in England are now affected. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Hi there, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Another fine late summer day for most of us. Warm sunny spells. There will be some showers around. Mostly these will affect Western Scotland, Northern Ireland and the far southeast. But otherwise high pressure is sitting to the north of the UK. We've got this easterly airflow that is bringing in some areas of cloud into the east. And like I say, one or two showers for East Anglia and the southeast. Another area of showers potentially for southwest Scotland. Northern Ireland. But away from those areas, there will be some sunshine coming through, especially for northern western England, as well as parts of Wales. And it will feel warm in the sunshine with temperatures in the south up to 24, 25 Celsius, perhaps 26 Celsius, 16 to 20 for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Through the evening, any showers tend to disappear, but one or two will continue into the east of England. Cloud also tends to fade away, and so with clear spells, and uh, some light winds in places. Uh, we'll see a few mist and fog patches developing across, say, parts of Wales and Western England. Single figures in some sheltered spots as well, but otherwise for most it's 12 to 15 Celsius as we start off 
Wednesday and uh, plenty of sunshine around first thing. Again, there'll be one or two showers, so this time focused towards uh, parts of Yorkshire into Lincolnshire and then developing a bit more widely across northern England and North Wales. But away from those showers, actually a bit more sunshine compared with today, with temperatures reaching 25 or 26 Celsius in the south, high teens, low 20s in the north. Any showers once again tend to disappear inland through the evening, but one or two will continue to affect coastal parts of eastern England. But otherwise, clear spells for many on Wednesday night and another fine day to come on Thursday. Then a change starts to get going on Friday and more especially on Saturday, turning much more unsettled with some heavy rain. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, mate. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Today, women in England and Wales will have permanent access to at-home abortion pills, but a GB News investigation has revealed a significant rise in the number of women requiring ambulance call-outs since the medication became available. Pills by post were temporarily introduced during the pandemic and allowed women to be sent them without a face-to-face -face consultation, but figures obtained exclusively by this channel show the number of ambulance call-outs increased by 64%, with some trusts taking double the number of calls from women concerned after taking the pills. Alice Porter has this, with a warning that some viewers may find her report disturbing. Kirsty was in a coercive relationship during the first lockdown. Her boyfriend forced her to order abortion pills over the phone, which she took beyond the 10-week limit. I made the phone call to the abortion clinic, sort of hoping that they'd sort of question my decision, because I knew deep down that I didn't want to do it. And I, I didn't have any checks. They didn't even offer me a scan, so I wasn't even sure. I, I wasn't sure of what the dates anyway of when I first found out I was pregnant. So you got the abortion pills. Just explain what the process was like when you took the tablets. Terrible cramps for hours. And then once I'd lifted my blanket, I was just, I was saturated in blood. And it wasn't my blood, it was my baby's blood. Before the pandemic, all women who wanted an abortion had to be seen in person by a medical professional. They'd be assessed and scanned. If they were in the early stages of pregnancy, they'd be given two abortion pills, one to take in the clinic and one to take home. Now, of course, that wasn't practical during lockdown, so the government introduced a scheme where women would be sent abortion pills in the post to take at home. But with no one seeing them in person, has there been enough safeguarding? We sent a freedom of information request to all the ambulance trusts in England. Of the six which responded, 
all showed that since abortion pills by post became available in 2020, there's been a rise in the number of women ringing 999 about abortion pills and an increase in ambulance dispatches. London saw the number of call-outs go from 93 in 2019 to 150 in 2020, a 61% increase. In the east of England, the number of call-outs went from 7 in 2019 to 24 in 2020, a rise of 243%. And in the southwest, the number of call-outs went from 33 in 2019 to 74 in 2020, up by 124%. The National Network of Designated Healthcare Professionals has also recorded cases of women taking abortion pills when they're too far along, resulting in a small number of aborted babies being born alive. As a result, one ambulance trust has spent £7,000 on making special mannequins to train their staff when confronted with this difficult situation. But Anne Faraday is former head of the British Pregnancy Advisory Service and says for the vast majority of women, at-home abortions are completely safe. The only downside is that sometimes a doctor or a nurse can perhaps pick up cues by seeing someone in front of them that they wouldn't pick up remotely. But we can't organise medical care on the basis of just the very few. We have to really look at what's best for everyone in these circumstances and home use pills by post definitely is. While at-home abortions may not suit some women, today's announcement does allow everyone the opportunity of deciding which option is best for them. Alice Porter, GB News. And we can speak to Alice now. Alice, excellent investigation uh, from you there. Thank you. What's the government saying in response? Well, the Department for Health and Social Care say clinicians have a legal obligation to certify in good faith that a woman is in the first 10 weeks of pregnancy before she's prescribed abortion pills and the woman should be given the choice either to have an in-person consultation or one done over the phone. And I think the word choice there is really important because in the first lockdown, that choice wasn't available. The majority of women who had abortions in the early stages of pregnancy in that, say, first year would have been women who would have had them at home. Now, women are free to choose which is best for them. And it's important to stress, particularly for women who live in rural areas, women who live in areas with poor public transport links, it will be a much preferred option to be able to speak on the phone rather than going in potentially repeatedly to a clinic. So that would be a huge advantage for many women there. But of course, this investigation raises a number of questions in terms of why there's this increase in 999 calls and also why there's this increase in ambulance dispatch. And I think the quote there from the government about clinicians having a legal obligation to certify in good faith is quite interesting because some would argue it's difficult to certify in good faith if you're not seeing someone in person and you're not performing an ultrasound, which would have always happened pre-pandemic. But some people would also argue that in the first few weeks of pregnancy, it wouldn't even show up on a scan. So that's what makes it much more complicated. And it's also much more complicated when we look at the issue of children because children have also been able to obtain at-home abortions and that is something that has had criticism from some clinicians but today we are expecting some updated uh, advice and updated safeguard and guidance from the Royal Co College of Paediatrics and Child Health in regards to how there could be better safeguarding for those who are under the age of 18 and want to have an early abortion. Thank you for bringing us that exclusive Alice Porter, thank you. Now, it's one year today since the West's withdrawal from Afghanistan, with many saying the decisions by successive US presidents to pull out of Afghanistan severely dented America's standing in the world. As well as living under Taliban rule, the people of Afghanistan have been hit by a devastating economic crisis, with around half the population facing the threat of starvation. Our security editor, Mark White, reports. <laughs>
12 months on from the chaos and the carnage of a sudden, badly managed withdrawal, Afghanistan has all but disappeared from our nightly news bulletins. Yet right across this country, they're living with the consequences of a decision made a world away in Washington. Here in the capital and elsewhere, the queues at the UN's World Food Programme feeding stations are constant. Afghans who just a year earlier held down respectable jobs, now forced to beg for handouts. My husband was martyred the day the Taliban came to power a year ago. We had some savings from his service to the Afghan army over the last 15 years. Now all that is finished. People cannot afford things from my shop now. There is no business for people. The sanctions have had a huge impact on our businesses. The Afghan assets frozen by America are essential for food security and the value of our currency. The United Nations has described the situation here as the world's largest humanitarian disaster, with over half the population facing the threat of starvation. It is the outcome many had feared that they'd warned would follow from the decision by US President Joe Biden to exit Afghanistan two decades after coalition forces first entered this country. The Taliban took full advantage, and as they rolled towards and then into the capital, panicked Afghans, many who'd worked for the government and coalition forces, scrambled to get out. At Kabul airport, US, British and other troops tried their best to manage the withdrawal, but increasingly desperate locals broke through the airport's perimeter. In horrifying scenes, some jumped onto one departing US aircraft, only to plunge to their deaths as it gathered speed and took off. As the world watched, President Biden doubled down on his decision to pull out. I was not going to extend this forever war. And I was not extending a forever exit. Just days before the end of the pullout in the huge sewage canal alongside the airport where thousands had been queuing, a suicide bomb attack by the Islamic State. 13 members of the US military were among the more than 180 killed. Right across the political spectrum, in the US and beyond, President Biden's handling of the Afghan withdrawal has been widely criticized, branded a low point in America's standing in the world. Many analysts believe it simply emboldened autocrats like Vladimir Putin. The message that our withdrawal sent to the world, which I believe helped encourage President Putin to invade Ukraine. I think the, the reduction in US international credibility and reliability, I think, has made the world much, much less safe. In the years since the pullout, the UK has taken more than 20,000 Afghans as part of the resettlement programme. But many more remain, trapped in country and unable to leave. Throughout Afghanistan, Taliban promises they've changed that women could continue to work and girls would get a full education have fallen way short. On the security side, fears remain that extremist groups will continue to take hold here. One Western documentary maker who spent a significant amount of time with the Taliban has documented their continued fight against Islamic State. It's one extremist group he says the Taliban seem determined to confront. The strong part of the Taliban is actually security. They have been fighting Islamic State for, you know, uh, six years now. Um, so, so that's the thing they can do. Uh, and uh, they are not doing this to, to, you know, to satisfy the Western audiences. Uh, they are doing this because they want the uh, Islamic State eliminated in Afghanistan. 
but last month's U.S. drone strike, which targeted and killed the al-Qaeda leader in Afghanistan, highlights the continued security concerns here. Ayman al-Zawahiri had been living in a property in Kabul, reportedly owned by a top aide to a Taliban government official. Twelve months on from the Western withdrawal here, the Taliban may be celebrating, but the extremist threat remains. The humanitarian crisis is worsening, and the freedoms spoken of by the new government are yet another false promise to the long-suffering people of this beautiful but troubled nation. Mark White, GB News. Now, if you treated yourself to some fish and chips over the weekend, you might have noticed a significant price hike. The soaring price of cod, sunflower oil and energy has left many local chip shops struggling for survival. The National Federation of Fish Friars has even warned that our iconic fish and chips could soon be a thing of the past. Our southwest of England reporter, Jeff Moody, has this. A British bank holiday weekend. Fish and chips, salt and vinegar, mushy peas, curry sauce. Our chippy teas are as British as Yorkshire pudding. It's always been a thing. When you go to the seaside, you have your rock, you have your fish and yeah. chips, you can hear the seagulls. Yeah, but it was it always better goes. in newspaper. Years ago, when I was growing up, it was a poor man's meal. Now, just bought two lots of fish and chips, 23 quid. But why is our erstwhile national dish now so expensive? The fish prices have gone up extortionately. Um, the oil prices have gone up extortionately and everything across the whole spectrum that we sell have gone up extortionately. So we're finding it a struggle to keep our prices reasonable and competitive. I mean, it's alright for me to go in there and get one portion for myself, but that was £11 just for one person. <laughs> it's a lot of money, isn't it? So can you imagine, you know, you've got a group of five or six, that's, an ex that's probably more expensive than going to a restaurant. The National Federation of Fish Friars believes the industry could be on the verge of extinction. They've been pressing for help from the government. At the moment, we've got VAT at 20%. I think that needs reducing down to 5% at, at, at the most, uh, just like during the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Other than that, we need a long-term strategy for hospitality. I think there needs to be a plan that sees beyond any leadership elections or general elections, something that will take us a view to 10 years in the future. So we, we can build a strong hospitality sector. It's not just fish and chips, it's the entire sector. Next week, a new Prime Minister takes the helm in Westminster with the biggest inbox ever seen in peacetime. Add to that list, saving the humble chippy. Jeff Moody, GB News. Gosh, 11 quid for fish and chips. Now, thanks for getting in touch today. Roger says, can we please stop letting people talk? Nonsense. He doesn't use the word nonsense, but I will. About Boris's legacy and politics, this country is heading for a catastrophe because of the last 30 years of government policies, 10 years or more under the Tories. Sue says, hello, Gloria. Rishi is being so bad, he continues to badmouth Liz. It's shocking. I've only heard Liz being negative about Rishi's policies. Rishi continually gets personal. He's badly letting himself down. Kevin says, we should go back to when I was at school in the 70s. My school gave out school sew-on badges. My mother then used to go to the local market to buy my black jacket cheap and stitch the badge on. You have been watching or listening to The Briefing with me, Gloria DiPiero. I'm back every Monday to Thursday from noon. Up next, it's on the money with Liam Halligan. For now, it is time for your weather. Hi there, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Another fine late summer day for most of us. Warm, sunny spells. There will be some showers around. Mostly these will affect Western Scotland, Northern Ireland and the far southeast. But otherwise, high pressure is sitting to the north of the UK. We've got this easterly airflow that is bringing in some areas of cloud into the east. And like I say, one or two showers for East Anglia in the southeast, another area of showers potentially for southwest Scotland, Northern Ireland. But away from those areas, there will be some sunshine coming through, especially for northern western England, as well as parts of Wales. And it will feel warm in the sunshine with temperatures in the south up to 24, 25 Celsius, perhaps 26 Celsius, 16 to 20 for Scotland and Northern Ireland. 
through the evening, any showers tend to disappear, but one or two will continue into the east of England. Cloud also tends to fade away, and so with clear spells. And uh, some light winds in places uh, will see a few mist and fog patches developing across, say, parts of Wales and Western England. Single figures in some sheltered spots as well, but otherwise for most it's 12 to 15 Celsius as we start off Wednesday and uh, plenty of sunshine around first thing. Again, there'll be one or two showers, this time focused towards uh, parts of Yorkshire into Lincolnshire and then developing a bit more widely across northern England and North Wales. But away from those showers, actually a bit more sunshine compared with today, with temperatures reaching 25 or 26 Celsius in the south, high teens, low 20s in the north. Any showers once again tend to disappear inland through the evening, but one or two will continue to affect coastal parts of eastern England. But otherwise, clear spells for many on Wednesday night and another fine day to come on Thursday. Then a change starts to get going on Friday and more especially on Saturday, turning much more unsettled with some heavy rain. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome to Tuesday's edition of On The Money with me, Liam Halligan, where for the next hour we'll be talking about the future of the Great British Pub. A combination of the rise in home entertainment plus two years of lockdown and now spiralling energy costs mean that far too many of our beloved local boozers are feeling the squeeze and their future could be in doubt. We'll be discussing that, plus yet more strike action across the UK and whether or not our fish and chip chops can survive. All that and more here on The Money after the GB News headlines with Rosie Wright. Good afternoon, it's just gone one o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright keeping you up to date on GB News. The London Mayor Sadiq Khan says he's sickened by the fatal stabbing of 21-year-old Takai Nemhard at Notting Hill Carnival. A murder inquiry is underway after the Bristol rapper, who performed under the stage name Tico Stretch, was attacked in the Labrook Grove area last night. He died in hospital. The Metropolitan Police made 209 arrests at the carnival over the bank holiday weekend, including 46 for assault and 33 for possessing an offensive weapon. More than 30 arrests have been made in Liverpool following the fatal shooting of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell. The schoolgirl is one of four people killed in Merseyside this month. Operation Miller, undertaken by Merseyside police, is part of a crackdown on organised crime. 
The force made 32 arrests and stopped a search of further 66 people. The police says it will leave no stone unturned to protect the public. Ukraine says it's taking back territory occupied by Russian forces in several areas of the front line after launching a counterattack. Ukrainian forces have launched an offensive near Kherson in the south of the country. Britain's Ministry of Defence say long-range precision strikes continue to disrupt Russia's resupply efforts. However, the Kremlin insists the assaults have failed. President Zelensky is urging Russian troops to flee. The occupiers must know we will chase them to the border, to our border, which line has not been changed. Occupiers are well aware of it. If they want to survive, it's time for the Russian military to run away. Go home. If you're afraid of going back home to Russia, well then let such occupiers surrender and we'll guarantee them that all the norms of the Geneva Conventions will be fulfilled. If they don't hear me, they will have to deal with our defenders who will not stop until they free everything that belongs to Ukraine. Iraqi cleric Mutar Sadar has told his followers to end their protests after nearly two days of violent clashes in central Baghdad. 22 people have been killed in the demonstrations, which started after al-Sadar announced his retirement from politics. Well, dozens more were injured after protesters stormed the presidential palace. Iraq's government has been deadlocked since Mr al-Sadar's party won the largest share of seats in parliamentary elections in October, but not enough to secure a majority government. The UN Secretary-General warns Pakistan's facing a monsoon on steroids after catastrophic flooding that's killed over 1,100 people. Antonio Guterres is urging the world to help as he launched a $160 million appeal. He said funds raised would provide 5.2 million people with food, water, sanitisation and health support. More than 33 million people have been affected by the flooding. Pubs and brewers across the UK are at risk of closure amid months amid months of energy price hikes of up to 300%. Six of the UK's biggest firms have signed an open letter to the government asking for action to avoid irreversible damage, they say, to the sector. Some pub owners say they're now struggling to find suppliers who are even willing to power their venues. Well, meanwhile, the Chancellor is going to travel to the United States this week to try to find joint solutions for the cost of living crisis. Nadim Zahawi is going to meet with government officials and bankers in New York and Washington, D.C. The Treasury says he'll push for cooperation on energy, security, tackling spiralling prices and economic growth. Liz Truss's campaign team says she'll wait until she becomes Prime Minister before finalising her plans for cost of living support. The Tory leadership contender wants to hold off until she's heard the full advice, which she won't have until and if she's appointed as PM. However, the Labour Party says Liz Truss is causing families unnecessary worry. The Labour chair, Annalise Dodds, told us Liz Truss needs to act now. Energy price rises, as you know, they're a big contributor to inflation. If we manage to stop that price rise, uh, that price cap rise going through, then we would be reducing the rate of inflation. That would, for example, get the cost of government borrowing down as well. So it's really important that Trust actually listens to what Labour is calling for and stops flip-flopping about with all these different plans that she seems to be floating, actually gets a grip and says that she'll commit to Labour's plan. BT and open reach workers are staging fresh strikes over pay as the summer of industrial unrest across the country continues. The Communication Workers Union says 40,000 of its members at BT Group are showing serious determination to get a decent wage rise.